Augmented reality has been the interface of the future for decades. The computing format has developed from the original mention of the head-mounted display in 1968 with the Harvard University computer scientist Ivan Sutherland. As his Wikipedia page states, Sutherland has been credited as the father of computer graphics, so it's fitting that he should introduce the augmentation of human vision with exactly that. Virtual and augmented reality were indistinguishable at this early stage, and so his first system, the Sword of Damocles, wasn't distinguished between the two. It was both virtual reality and augmented reality. More recently, as the industry has matured, differing experiences have been defined with greater clarity, which we'll explore very shortly. To the average consumer, these alternate reality experiences have been evolving very slowly over the past 50 years. Computation has been very clearly outpaced by human imagination, and cinema, with its computer-generated renderings, has instead carried the baton forward, capturing the excitement of what might be possible in the future for moviegoers around the world. What is what? He asked you a question. What is that? Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Full impact. Final round to Janeway. Winner, Janeway. Good game. For you. Many would argue that film hasn't just carried imagination forward, but presented a wealth of inspiration for user interface design and experiences that will later follow when reality eventually catches up to fantasy. Which brings me on to why I'm making this video now, in 2017. Well, for the first time this year, we saw the introduction of several pieces of the puzzle that lay the foundation for augmented reality to finally take off into an affordable and accessible mainstream audience, versus what has been previously limited, highly technical, expensive, and exclusive. Each part of this puzzle, as a part of the framework, is essential to both the widespread development and consumption of this technology. I've broken down the frameworks into three separate cogs, any one of which fails, and augmented reality's future might not look so rosy. Let's have a look. Number one. We now have standardized development platforms for developers to reliably build AR apps with, AR Kit and AR Core. That comes with the promise of number two, which is paying customers through a massive pre-existing app store ecosystem where customers can purchase and access those AR apps. And thirdly, highly distributed AR-ready hardware that millions of people already have in their pockets today. These are the smartphones which users can access AR content with through the app stores, namely with Android and iOS. Basically, consider how the internet would never have taken off originally without the infrastructure of physical phone lines already built into our streets. We couldn't at that time at least, have one without the other. It's this system that will likely become self-reinforcing and so contribute to the fast growth of augmented reality over the next few years. As industry veteran Matt Miesniak says in a recent Medium article, with the launch of ARKit, we are going to see AR apps become available for around 500 million iPhones in the next 12 months, and at least triple that in the following 12 months. For the cynics, however, the question remains whether its first mainstream exposure will produce a level of excitement that quickly comes and goes, like the meteoric rise and fall of Pokemon Go's popularity, or whether it stands the test of time by offering utility beyond novelty with features that improve upon what is available through the flat, square screens we use traditionally. Broadly, technological progress has finally started to make it possible for these alternate computing realities to begin permeating every facet of our lives. With that said, however, going mainstream does not mean that smartphone augmented reality is as good as it can get. Rather, as we'll also see, handheld AR brings with it a bevy of handicaps that in the best case opens people's eyes to what's possible, but in the worst, waters down excitement and sets low expectations of what AR is to the average person. Something not unlike the failure of Nintendo's Virtual Boy VR headset launched in the 90s, which was cancelled just six months later. The technology wasn't ready. Virtual Boy, see it now in 3D. But by then, the branding damage to VR had been dealt for that decade. With that brief overview, we're now going to focus the rest of this episode on the present and future of augmented reality, where we're at technologically today, where we need to get, as well as the good that can come from it, 
and of course, the bad. Strap yourselves in. So let's start getting a little more technical here. I'll note that as I'm not an augmented reality expert myself, I lent heavily on Matt Miesniex for the researching of this episode, who I quoted in the intro. At this point, I think it's worth qualifying his opinion. Matt Miesniex is a developer, entrepreneur, and investor who has worked in the AR industry for nine years now. He's helped to build technology very similar to ARKit in the past, but the technology was ahead of its time when the hardware wasn't able to support it well enough. In essence, he has an insider's view on how these systems are built and why they are built the way they are. He publishes the occasional article through medium.com and I recommend you follow him if you're into this episode. So let's now get our feet wet by defining some terms. Virtual reality, augmented reality, and the newcomer, mixed reality. The first two are easily defined. The third one, with it being so young, is still maturing as different companies attempt to claim ownership and branding control. Let's make this as simple as possible. If your field of view is completely represented through computer graphics, you're in virtual reality. For example, if you're flying through space, shooting at enemy spaceships. If your field of view is only partially represented through computer graphics and you can still see the real world around you, that's augmented reality. However, there is one more useful distinction and that's with how the computer graphics interface with the world as seen by the camera. Classic AR is no more than a heads up display or HUD, which is effectively static digital information overlaid in front of you. This is distinct from the term head mounted display, which encompasses any wearable device that you look through. Think of an altitude display sitting in front of a pilot or Google Glass prompting a reminder. The distinction here is that the digital information does not interface with your environment at all. It's just a dumb screen. Modern AR, however, is far more exciting in that it allows you to digitally enhance places, things, and people directly in 3D. Think Snapchat lenses, newer versions of Pokemon Go where the little critters remain more anchored to the real world, and the popular tape measure app seen made with early versions of AR Kit, where you can measure lengths with your moving phone and have the digital tape measure stay in place. Essentially, your digital media begins to understand your world, and it opens up a whole other universe of possible experiences, which we'll explore later. With this in mind, we can label the world's first HMD, the Sword of Damocles, as an augmented reality device. The user can move around a 3D cube, but the room is seen in the background at the same time. Now for mixed reality, where things get a little bit more complicated for the majority of consumers who come under the category of non-geek. For example, Microsoft have claimed the term after deciding that VR and AR are obsolete terms on the same technological continuum, a continuum that they call mixed reality. Alex Kipman, inventor of the Windows augmented reality device HoloLens, offers that to simplify things, we call all of it Windows mixed reality. The CEO, Satya Nadella, has said whether it be HoloLens, Mixed Reality, or Surface, their tablet PC line of products, our goal is to invent new computers and new computing. Although, of course, rather than simplifying things, a third term for consumers to wrap their heads around may have made the playing field anything but simple. It's true, however, that many pioneering companies are making it clear that the future of AR and VR lie in the development of devices which do both. Another large competitor, Qualcomm, after making this point in a recent article penned on their company blog, introduced yet another term that they call XR, or Extended Reality. They say XR is an umbrella term encapsulating augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and everything in between. I know what you're thinking. Please stop with the terminology overload. I'll just say once more, these early days will be a battleground over terminology as companies fight to establish terms that have an association to specific brands. Being first in the mind of consumers is as, if not more valuable than being first to market. The side effect, however, is that the selfish perspective of corporations comes at the expense of complicating the playing field for consumers. ARKit and ARCore changed the game in a big way. They leveraged the vast pre-existing network of devices around the world into vehicles for AR. And with that, the money follows. Friends coax friends into becoming AR advocates and developers begin lining up to provide services through the App Store. The users with hardware provide the distribution and the developers provide the all important content. The chicken and egg problem are already averted. 
but developing content for new platforms, new design paradigms no less, is going to make success even more challenging, with AR being complex and such an unknown entity from many angles. There is both the intimidation aspect as well as technical difficulties of development to consider. This is where ARKit and ARCore come in to provide standardized tools and rules to guide developers as they realize the service they've imagined. Specifically to AR, we're broadly talking about things like tracking, so the device knows where its orientation is in 3D space, scene understanding, so digital assets can be anchored to the real world and available light can be determined for shading those digital assets, and then rendering, driving all of that collected data into a renderer to be visualized to the end user. Getting more technical, as Miesniex describes in an article titled Why is ARKit better than the alternatives, he describes ARKit as a visual inertial odometry, a VIO system, with some simple 2D plane detection. VIO means that the software tracks your position in space, your six degrees of freedom pose, in real time, i.e. your pose is recalculated in between every frame refresh on your display, about 30 or more times a second. These calculations are done twice in parallel. Your pose is tracked via the visual camera system by matching a point in the real world to a pixel on the camera sensor each frame. Your pose is also tracked by the inertial system. Your accelerometer and gyroscope together referred to as the inertial measurement unit or IMU. The output of both of these systems are then combined via a Kalman filter which determines which of the two systems is providing the best estimate of your real position referred to as ground truth and publishes that pose update via the ARKit SDK. Just like your odometer in your car tracks the distance the car has traveled, the VIO system tracks the distance that your iPhone has traveled in 6D space. 6D means 3D of XYZ motion, translation, plus 3D of pitch, your roll, rotation. He then goes on to say, the second main piece of AR kit is simple plane detection. This is needed so that you have the ground to place your content on, otherwise it would look like it's floating horribly in space. This is calculated from the features detected by the optical system, those little dots you see in demos, and the algorithm just averages them out as any three dots defines a plane. And if you do this enough times, you can estimate where the real ground is. For your information, these dots are often referred to as a point cloud, which is another confusing term. These dots or points all together are a sparse point cloud, which is used for optical tracking. Sparse point clouds use much less memory and CPU time to track against, and with the support of the inertial system, the optical system can work just fine with a small number of points to track. This is a different type of point cloud to a dense point cloud that can look close to photorealism. Note some trackers being researched can use a dense point cloud for tracking, so it's even more confusing. This plane detection he speaks about is a pillar of computer vision, another area of computer research that also began in the late 60s along with computer graphics and augmented reality, although it's more closely associated with artificial intelligence, AI. In recent years, augmented reality has crossbred into multiple computer intelligence disciplines. One example of this merging is what's known as SLAM technology, or simultaneous localization and mapping. Wikipedia defines this as the computational problem of constructing or updating a map of an unknown environment, while simultaneously keeping track of an agent's location within it. Progress in recent years has been pushed forward from heavy investment into self-driving car technology, and augmented reality stands to benefit from this. AR Core, the Android equivalent that was released after AR Kit, has much the same functionality, but it's actually more mature, having spun out of the Google Tango software development kit, which has had at least two more years of development. As Miesniex says, Putting aside the naming, if you added depth camera sensor hardware to a phone which runs AR Core, you'd have a Tango phone. So it seems as though AR Core was rushed out as a follow up to AR Kit so as to be compatible with far more devices. One reason that Tango never took off was that it never had distribution. There were very few handsets that had all the necessary hardware required to run it. They were bulky, expensive, and unproven. This is all pretty technical, but I know some folks watching this will appreciate the specificity. Again, go check out Miesniex on Medium to read more of his stuff.
In summation, without a platform, each of these tasks would be a marathon challenge on their own for individual developers. ARKit and ARCore, along with every stepping stone that necessarily preceded their arrival, are why 2017 is the year AR launched into a mainstream audience. It now leaves businesses and developers to focus more on the consumer experience and user interface, and less on the low-level engineering problems that only need to be solved once and gradually iterated upon. Relatedly, already there are other technical aspects of augmented reality becoming commoditized and licensed. For example, Miesniex believes that positional tracking, so-called six degrees of freedom, will be completely commoditized in 12 to 18 months beyond the middle of 2017. And another augmented reality company, Ave Gant, have revealed that they actually plan to license out their light-filled display hardware to companies rather than commit to developing their own product. This way, they can focus on their intellectual property rather than attempting to raise millions, if not billions more, on consumer-facing departments such as customer service and marketing, maintenance of multiple manufacturing lines, software development for the operating system, as well as ensuring a library of launch content for users to build demand. And of course, there's the challenge of also educating your market as you try to introduce a new paradigm of computing. Needless to say, this is all very expensive. And so it makes sense that the augmented reality industry would increasingly commoditize, allowing more marketing-centric companies to spend the time educating and selling to consumers while licensing much of their complex technology. And this is all very promising, because it means that new ideas can be developed far more quickly and affordably than if the industry was becoming a walled garden. Only a few companies will effectively go the whole way themselves and become a so-called full-stack company in augmented reality. Examples include Apple, Google, and the notoriously secretive company Magic Leap. Many people have an idea of what augmented reality is. Ask anyone who's seen any number of futuristic Hollywood blockbusters in the last 50 years. What's not so widely known is how AR can best augment our lives. How can it make our lives easier and more enjoyable beyond what our current phones and computers can do today? Well, the truth is, in these early days with smartphone augmented reality, it's still going to be held back by several problems which, until they've been resolved, will hold back the mainstream adoption of AR as a platform even as it's made broadly available. The key lies in being offered utility in addition to novelty. That is, opportunities to increase our daily output through AR as opposed to just providing entertainment and a laugh. I'll explore these early problems through the following four sections. Number one, design standards. Number two, the letterbox and brick problem. Number three, most people aren't geeks. And number four, technical hurdles. For your information, the content of this section can be read about in more detail in Miesniek's article titled, Why Apple's Glasses Won't Include AR Kit. Number one, design standards. Let's start design standards with a practical example. This is a diagram from Yesnex's article AR First, Mobile Second, illustrating the evolution of UI, from print to web to mobile and augmented reality. What he's showing is that initial products in a new medium are typically designed in the same way successful products from the prior medium were designed. Remember me? I'm the kid that had a report to on space. Then I got the new Encyclopedia Britannica. He had a report due on space, and then he got the new Encyclopedia... I think I made that abundantly clear. Um, uh, yes. Anyhow, here it is. I mean, hey, everybody knows this is the greatest encyclopedia in the world. Encyclopedia Britannica, an iconic brand whose volumes have lined shelves of homes and libraries since it was first published 244 years ago. Yet the times have changed. People don't page through heavy books anymore. They use Google. And so, Britannica is undergoing a major transformation. It's no longer printing books. Not questioning the wisdom of ain't broke, don't fix it, established apps are awkwardly ported over, much in the fashion of poking a square peg into a round hole. It's not yet known what shape the hole is for the new medium, and so the result during the early adopter phase is a library of novelty, rather than utility, experiences. We fall back on mental models of what worked in the past. Hollywood, as we saw in the intro, will give us some conceptual ideas of what a truly 3D interface might look like, but well-established heuristics will regress us back to tried and true beliefs at the start. Miesny X offers the example of hearing people say, it would be great to see my Uber approaching, even though a 2D map does a great job of this. 
The apps that ultimately command the most attention in augmented reality will be those that capitalize on utility use cases that simply cannot be produced in old design paradigms. Often, it takes a brand new company to see mediums from clean perspectives, a reason why startups have generally had an advantage over corporations when it comes to innovation. Miesniex believes that we need an AR-native HMD GUI, that's a head-mounted display graphical user interface, which means an entirely new paradigm for applications, as the desktop metaphor we've used for the past 40 years doesn't really hold anymore, he says. A 4x6 grid of square icons filling our transparent display FOV, field of view, won't work, he goes on. There's an opportunity for an entirely new app ecosystem apart from iOS and Android to emerge, as almost none of the prior 10 years of work building smartphone apps will come across into AR. We're going to look into a little known company a bit later who have a huge opportunity to become the leader here and would broadly contribute to the multi-billion dollar valuation that the company currently has. A company, it's worth noting, that didn't exist just eight years ago. Miesniex also reveals that there are rumors Apple has a mature 3D graphical user interface solution that works nicely in their lab today, a reason perhaps for the lackluster emphasis on augmented reality at the recent iPhone X event. So you can be happy, or sad, or cross. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Speaking of UI design for smartphone AR specifically leads us to the letterbox and brick problem. As you'll see, even if AR native design can move us towards utility, it's the hardware which once more carries us back to novelty. Number two, the letterbox and brick problem. As I write the script, Apple have just announced their new line of handsets for 2017, the iPhone 8s as well as the iPhone 10. Although most of the hardware details had leaked over the preceding weeks and months, it was expected that a decent chunk of the keynote would be dedicated to this next generational paradigm shift in user interface design, which is augmented reality. There was no such chunk, more like a throwaway, which is surprising given what Tim Cook, the CEO, has publicly said about the new medium. I regard it as a big idea, like the smartphone. The smartphone is for everyone. We don't have to think the iPhone is about a certain demographic, or country, or vertical market. It's for everyone. I think AR is that big. It's huge. I get excited because of the things that could be done that could improve a lot of lives, and be entertaining. I couldn't help but chuckle at the quick addition of the and be entertaining sentence after improve a lot of lives, almost an admission that we're not there yet with smartphones as improving lives is synonymous with utility. Augmented reality evangelist Robert Scoble called it totally undersold, with no effort at explaining why Apple's new OS is bringing a new world to us. So what could explain this change of direction? Well, as I alluded to in the previous section, it might just be because Apple have seen the future, and it makes smartphone AR look like the original Game Boy placed alongside the Switch. Glasses AR, if you will. Let's put it this way. James Cameron, the director of Avatar, calls you up, and he says, Hey, I can take you to the lush, alien planet of Pandora. I can allow you to step into another fantastical universe through a giant, powerful animal that you control through linking to your brain. You can swing from tree to tree and drink the local nectar to your heart's content, even though in your human form you're disabled and have to use a wheelchair. Want to try it? Sure, you say, trying to play it cool. And then he says, but there's a catch. You can only experience it through a letterbox. Oh, and also hold this brick although your arm will get tired. Not so fun now, huh? Augmented reality promises so much, most of which we can't possibly imagine now. On one hand, that's because we still don't know how to design the user interface of augmented reality, as we saw with the print to web to mobile to augmented reality chart earlier. But bigger than this, ultimately, is that as long as AR is letterboxed into a window in front of our eyes in the form of a handheld device with a 2D screen, the exciting potential of what AR can be will be lost. And that's not all. For as long as AR can only be experienced when holding a brick, that is, your phone, any experience which lasts more than 15 seconds is going to be diminished by the distraction that your arm is actually starting to ache. In effect, augmented reality won't truly be here until the letterbox and the brick problems have been removed from the equation. And when that moment arrives, we get the presence, we get the convenience, 
and we get a product that, without the previous limitations, can now develop the consumer demand for experiences that last hours at a time, rather than seconds. And when experiences are hours rather than seconds, you guessed it. That's when we get the magic word, utility. As a result, Miesniak's advice to developers is the following. I would encourage devs not to be afraid of building novelty apps. Fart apps were the first hit on smartphones. Also, it's very challenging to find use cases that give utility via AR on handheld, see-through, form factor hardware. As Miesniak continues, through all of history, we have consumed visual content through a rectangle, from stone tablets to cinema to smartphones, etc. And AR is the first medium that is completely unbound. This is what AR wants to be, unbound. Ironically, however, smartphone AR means experiencing that unbound computing format through a rectangle. So if you are planning on getting the iPhone 10 for its augmented reality functionality, just make sure you're happy with fun and brief over getting stuff done. Although with Apple shining the spotlight on animated poo, unicorns and monkeys, you probably didn't need me to reiterate that point. Number three, most people aren't geeks. Technology companies can often market their products in a way that assumes everyone is a geek, a deficiency of customer empathy more than strategic planning. Consider which of the following two MP3 players sound better to you. Number one, five gigabyte hard drive, AIFF and WAV formats, and can support MP3 bit rates up to 320 kilobytes per second. Firewire connectivity, ultra portable, six and a half ounces versus number two, 1,000 songs in your pocket. iPod, a thousand songs in your pocket. As you might know, Apple took command of the MP3 player industry in the early 2000s. Before the iPod, products were advertised for their features, such as disk space, weight, and connectivity options. Apple played a big role in revealing that people don't buy features, they buy benefits. Marketing tech products is generally seen as one of Apple's strengths, a strength in understanding the customer as well as the technology. And this brings us to perhaps one of the most important aspects of consumer AR beyond novelty. Fashion. This arena no doubt offers key insights for AR glasses, which we'll explore a little later, but the same goes for AR on phones once you consider the social context. Fashion ultimately is a social constraint, and if AR wants to be considered fashionable, it's basically got to look cool by a significant number of people. Apple probably know they have an advantage here with their strong branding for cool things, but even they are not under the illusion that they can make letterbox and brick AR become cool. It has too many drawbacks, and if Apple do eventually decide to build AR smart glasses, which they probably will, this again will be at the top of their mind when designing a product. Being on the face, perhaps the most important area of the body regards fashion, it's likely they'll employ strategies that have worked for the Apple Watch, with different designs suiting different tastes, and allowing people the need for individuality. The recent controversy surrounding Google Glass and the glass hole phenomenon make this all the clearer, which is probably why rumours have recently indicated Apple to be working on a pair of Snap-style glasses versus something more complex. That is, a novel first step into AR glasses over utility. No one wants to walk around town with a phone strap to their face. Miesniex also offers a wealth of expert opinion on this topic of fashion, as well as an emphasis on the need to have an ability to share and communicate our experiences with others. At an earlier company he co-founded, Deco, he helped develop one of the first commercially available iOS multiplayer experiences. It was a digital remote control buggy game, which could collide and occlude with real world objects. He notes that the lift in enjoyment playing with others who could also see your buggy was exponential. Enjoyment isn't the only thing sociality brings, of course. We live our productive lives working with others, so with shared AR comes utility. One of the most exciting use cases here Miesniex offers is the concept of holoportation, a technology a research manager at Microsoft recently showed off in a YouTube video last year. Two men wearing HoloLens devices were able to see and talk to each other in the same room, even though they were separated by a large distance. 
Relatedly, in a video interview with Vice on YouTube, Miesniex reiterates the important role sociality will have in the future of augmented reality. As each phone starts to build its own little local 3D map of the world and those are passed up to the cloud, what ends up happening is 3D model of the whole world gets gradually built by everyone's device. That data is going to enable lots and lots of shared interactions between people. It's like you have this um, shared hallucination of, of what you're seeing and you know, way more enjoyable than just, just experiencing it on your own. Number four, technical hurdles. Finally, in this fourth part on the utility beyond novelty problem, we come to perhaps the most obvious challenge post for utility, which is technological hurdles that need to be overcome before we reach the point we can actually lose the novelty limitations in the early days. In essence, that means leaving the phone AR playground behind and getting suited and booted with a pair of AR glasses. Suddenly, we experience the hypothetical Pandora from Avatar up close and personal. No letterbox, no brick. More seriously though, AR glasses allow us to extend the time we live in AR, rather than holding and pointing your smartphone for 15 seconds at a time for a novel experience, you're now able to forget about technology and simply adopt what feels like, in a sense, a fundamental upgrade to perception. That's a big change from holding a square device in front of you, so much so that I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that AR in the future may introduce more profound existential questions around identity and human nature. But keeping on point here, as you increasingly live in AR, a myriad of practical facilities become feasible. Notifications become an instant utility, as you can have faith you won't miss them while a phone sits in your pocket. It also opens up opportunities for location-based notifications. If you find yourself downtown on the weekend, walking past Starbucks, a message offering a free drink might alert you to quench your thirst, assuming you've given permission. You're able to select your drink and authorise payment in seconds after receiving the alert, and your drink is practically ready the moment you sit down. If you're especially anti-consumerism, the same format could be implemented into a newer version of Pokemon Go, or an educational prompt to teach you about landmark you find yourself at. When doing your weekly shopping, your glasses are feeding you price comparison data on every product you look at, forcing supermarkets to become more competitive. Considering the hundreds of products your glasses recognise through new artificial intelligence technology, it's a utility that would never carry over onto a smartphone that instead requires you to point the camera at items while trying to push a trolley, and attempting to avoid crashing into people. This barely scratches the surface of what's possible when moving from smartphone AR to glasses AR, but it serves to highlight how what was previously novelty becomes far more valuable and essential in our lives. With those thought experiments in mind, let's look at the technological hurdles preventing us from getting there today. Miesniex breaks this down into four pillars as follows. Number one, optics that fit inside a consumer frame. Number two, natural input capture. Number three, high enough performing sensors and processes. And number four, artificial intelligence with an understanding of what's seen. We'll start with optics. Specifically, Miesniek says, this is about optics that fit inside a consumer frame. That is something considered fashionable enough to be worn publicly, as opposed to larger alternatives that might be used in the enterprise world, in a warehouse, for example. The optics need to be bright enough for daylight use, sharp enough to easily read text, and have a wide enough field of view so that we're not back to Bandora through a letterbox. Today, Miesniek says, the state of the art that can be manufactured in volume is an OLED micro display powering an injection molded waveguide, single focal plane. We're a year or two away from nicely functional better displays, and probably another year or so after that before those better displays can be manufactured in volume. There's a seven figure upfront one time optics design cost, and the high res micro OLEDs have been expensive, but they're dropping in price fast, says Miesniek. Also, as yet, no one has applied smartphone scale production economics onto HMD manufacturing. The next hurdle is natural input capture, that is, hardware to capture natural input from a user and software to reliably determine the user's intent from the input. This is big and not close to being solved, Miesniex adds. 
disappointingly. He says, the more you think about it, the more difficult you realise the problems are. Lots of efforts are going into perfecting single modes of input, perfect voice recognition, perfect gestures, perfect computer vision, etc. But even if you can perfect one mode, I doubt anyone can, there are going to be lots of circumstances where the user will never want to use that mode, e.g. voice input during a movie, a watch tap is better, or gestures while in public, voice might be better. The optimal system, Miesniex believes, is a multimodal system, with an AR to choose which input system best captures the user's intent at the time. It's understood that Apple, Microsoft, and Google, among others, are all working on multimodal input for AR, so it seems the industry has reached a consensus. However, these form factors are around 9-12 to 12 months away from shipping in products, albeit in a simple implementation. Following that, we have a need for sensors and processors that give high enough performance for a fluid experience. This means, as well, working for long periods of time without heat or weight ergonomic concerns. And that's not a small point. Heat and weight become far more important considerations when users are wearing the device on their face. Samsung need not apply. Better integration, Miesniex explains, also means more freedom to be fashionable for the designers. Moving from works on my phone to works on a see-through display means finding big improvements in power per watt and motion to photon engineering. Just because some AR feature works nice on my iPhone doesn't mean it can just be copied over to glasses. 3D reconstruction, machine learning applications, and coherent rendering are examples where the state of the art can just be achieved today on a phone, but they are quite heavy users of CPU and GPU, which drive up heat and suck battery life. He says to allow for 12 months until you could expect what works on a phone today to work on glasses. Finally here, the fourth technological hurdle we need to overcome, Miesniex believes, will be ensuring that AR glasses have an understanding of structure and semantics in a 3D world, in real time. Both AR Kit and AR Core are early versions of this, providing the six degrees of freedom pose relative to the user, as well as a basic ground plane, but there is a long way to go yet. Again, Miesniex believes it will become a more widely understood problem over the next 12-month time frame. He goes on, There's no point building an AR app unless it interacts with the physical world in some way. That's the definition of AR native. If there's no digital and physical interaction, then a regular smartphone app will give a better user experience. Tabletop 3D games on a flat table are the perfect example of why bother doing this in AR. In order to interact with the world, the system needs to capture or download a virtual 3D model of the world in front of me. But that's only the start. The next problem becomes how to ensure the layout of the content becomes procedurally responsive to the space limitations of each user. The key thing on HoloLens is the world awareness. As we scan the room, we exactly know where the walls are, where the ground is, where the tables are. Whenever we know all the information about the room, it starts looking for different points where a character could put his hand and lean again. This is another big problem, which is a universe away from the relatively minor challenges posed by four, five, and six inch screens. Although frameworks like ARKit and ARCore might be able to help with this eventually. Miesniex believes that someone needs to develop a procedural content layout tool which is simple enough for developers to use. Microsoft had a good shot at this with Flare a few years ago. They really are way ahead. Film SFX software, which can procedurally generate armies of digital orcs in a scene, is today's state of the art. He continues, The state of the art today in 3D reconstruction is real-time, dense, large-scale 3D reconstruction on a phone with a depth camera. Doing this without the depth camera is about 9 months of research away from working, and another 9-12 to 12 months away from productization. 3D semantic segmentation state of the art is that it works in a basic way on a phone today via academic code, but again, at least a couple of years to be really good enough for consumers. Future 2018 to 2020s. In the last section of this episode, we're going to look into the future of augmented reality. As you already know, augmented reality glasses are going to play a role, so that's what we'll concentrate on. Further afield, it seems technology will be miniaturized to the point glasses eventually become contact lenses, and even more speculatively, perhaps those lenses will evolve into computers that live inside our bodies, perhaps the brain. These more lofty ideas, though, are out
outside the scope of this episode, so we'll stay within the constraints of what's possible in 2018 and on into the 2020s. Technology companies that we all recognize today, from Apple to Google, are already hard at work on AR glasses. Even the recently launched company, Essential, known for the Essential phone, have indicated an interest through awarded patents. Unfortunately for those of us who are really into this stuff, that future is accompanied with a metric ton of secrecy. And furthermore, companies submit patents all the time, but there's no guarantee that what's seen will be built. Clusters of related patents, however, do give an indication of where industries are heading, so I'm not going to leave you disappointed. We're not going to be doing any detective work on Apple, Google, or Essential, no. The patents that they have in this space pale in comparison to another company who have been submitting a steady stream of patents since 2013. That company are Magic Leap, and they are exclusively an augmented reality company, or as they like to call it, mixed reality. Magic Leap, at least at the time of writing this episode, are still both pre-revenue and pre-product, and no one has even seen their first prototype publicly without first signing an NDA. Oh, and they might soon be valued at over $6 billion. If you had any doubts about AR, I think it's time we took a closer look. Introducing Magic Leap as Roni Abovitz, the founder of Magic Leap, says in an interview with Wired magazine, our brain is an amazing sensory computer. Magic Leap is just the pen and paper, the typewriter, or the canvas and brush for a power that people have had brewing in them since people first appeared. The real way to the future is biology. The real way to the future is biology. While the language is a little too flowery for some, it absolutely reinforces the chasm between smartphone AR and glasses AR, with what we've been learning throughout this episode. So with that in mind, what exactly does the future of so-called biological AR actually look like? As I mentioned earlier, Magic Leap have left some breadcrumbs for us through patents that have quietly been awarded to them over the past several years. With a brief Google search, I was able to find that Magic Leap were awarded one patent in 2013, three in 2014, 161 in 2015, 34 in 2016, and 80 in 2017. Although this isn't necessarily accurate, just an indication. So we're going to pry apart just a few right now. Let's start by taking a look at what this Magic Leap device might actually look like. The company were quick to point out that the design is not Magic Leap's current product, and was in fact submitted in 2015. Sources with first-hand experience of the product, however, said that the drawings were close to Magic Leap's product in its appearance, but the real hardware is bigger and bulkier. Now you've got an idea of what the technology looks like, let's see how it's going to upgrade your biology through a visual slideshow of patent drawings along with a little amateur commentary. In the first image here we see a cloud, which is a big giveaway. In a moment I'm going to explain how exactly Magic Leap might have reached such a high valuation so soon. Turns out, the cloud could play a big role. In the Utility Beyond Novelty problem, we explored the technical hurdles we need to overcome, with Miasniex listing natural input capture as one of the big challenges. This Magic Leap patent reveals how we might use a hand to interface with digital information. This bracelet is a strange one, which turns out to be a home for what Magic Leap calls totems. These are physical objects in the real world which are recognized by the AR glasses to have some accompanying digital function. For example, by pressing a finger on the Facebook icon there, your glass would fire up the Facebook app. This image depicts once more the concept of the totem, but this time the buttons are tracked onto your fingers. If you see these icons as the equivalent of your 4x6 grid of square icons on a phone, you can already see that it's a big jump forward in interface design, fully utilizing the freedom that comes with 3D space. This image depicts a person cutting a cucumber in a gamified format, a concept which appears to have been cheekily stolen from a concept video called Sight. So apparently weekends are going to be even better in the future. We see here, Simon, at least I imagine that's his name, uses his two hands to designate a new digital screen in front of his face, as well as its custom size. This is in addition to the large monitor a little further in front, which is also digital, and then a new form of contextual advertising that doesn't obstruct the content you're viewing. There also appears to be a 3D model of the sport being reproduced on the coffee table, a feat that would require special depth cameras at the stadium, 
I imagine. And then what looks to be three dials to his left for conveniently controlling the experience. Once again we find ourselves with Simon and now he's pointing at the wall at what looks like a character selection menu. This would likely require a device that understands the environment in such that the menu can be procedurally generated onto the wall as easily as onto a table or desk as Mirzniax has shared. Lastly here for home, Simon lost all free will and capitulated to the temptation of Netflix for a binge session. Again we can see controls and menus procedurally generated into the environment presented. Here we see a mother and daughter in the supermarket pushing a trolley. The handle of the trolley acts as a totem, perhaps through something like a QR code printed on the handle to prompt the digital interface, although by that point AI may have allowed recognition of the handle without physical prompts. The digital interface appears to be a shopping list written earlier, with windows for seeing what the child sees currently in the event of becoming separated, a recipe book and a coupon book. In the next patent drawing we see that the child is being occupied with a game, while the mother uses an apparently ill-positioned set of scales which might be digital. Let me know what you think what's going on here in the comments. Here we have what looks to be an experience initiated by the child. It's unlikely to be prompted by proximity given to the likelihood of landing someone flat on their back. The cereal mascot explodes from the aisle, presumably for marketing purposes, causing digital cereal boxes to fall off the shelf. Mother does not look amused. A doctor walks a patient through a 3D heart model, perhaps before an operation on her foot. There are digital windows above the patient's bed as well. After surgery, a patient can whisk themselves off to a tropical beach, or back home perhaps, to check on the plants. Finally here we have a gardener mowing the lawn with a drive on, and AR tracks painted on the ground for ensuring straight cuts, as well as AR mole characters holding gamified windows displaying points earned for accuracy. The AR window in front of the gardener lists data for a total score, total time, percentage of grass cut, area left, and accuracy. Why Magic Leap has such a high valuation as an AR company? So one question you may be burning to ask is, what exactly is that massive valuation for? Surely a company can't be worth six billion dollars for just a pair of AR glasses, can they? Well, no, hardware alone isn't necessarily going to make you a highly valuable company, although rumour has it that their display technology is very advanced. If hardware was the only key, however, some other AR glasses companies like Avegant and ODG would be closer to Magic Leap in valuation. To this point, they are still both sub billion dollar companies. We might also consider that replacing all pre-existing screens in your life today is very compelling as a selling point, saving consumers money in theory, but it doesn't directly generate revenue. Another consideration is technical patents, which can be valuable too, from the standpoint of protecting innovations such as display technology from other competitors. But to understand the broad scope of a possible $6 billion valuation at the time of writing this, I think we need to look into the deeper infrastructure of the company and what they're trying to build beyond hardware and software. Specifically, that's the development of massively networked platforms such as an AR app store and AR cloud, as well as a full stack system of production. It's these pillars propping up Magic Leap that take a modest company into a massively scaled international corporation that leverages network effects to continue growing beyond their own employees' efforts. In effect, they allow Magic Leap to snowball in size. So first of all, the App Store. The best example of why this is a big deal is to find the modern day equivalent, which might be Apple's App Store for phone applications, which was introduced way back in 2008. So you're a developer and you've just spent two weeks or maybe a little bit longer writing this amazing app. And what is your dream? Your dream is to get it in front of every iPhone user and hopefully they love it and buy it, right? That's not possible today. Developers don't, most developers don't have those kinds of resources. Even the big developers would have a hard time getting their app in front of every iPhone user. Well, we're gonna solve that problem for every developer, big to small. And the way we're gonna do it is what we call the App Store. App Store annual revenue is currently more than $28 billion. Developers earned $20 billion in 2016, which was up 40% from the year before. Apple keeps 30% of sales. Those margins in hardware are practically impossible, especially after you consider marketing, R&D, and developing manufacturing molds. So owning a leading app store that becomes a central hub for applications is a big, big deal for the bottom line.
As Miasniak says, there's an opportunity for an entirely new app ecosystem, apart from iOS and Android to emerge, as almost none of the prior 10 years of work building smartphone apps will come across into AR. Gizmodo.com reported in 2014 that Magic Leap's App Store might even have a name as they've trademarked the phrase, the Magic Shop. It comes with the following description. Retail store services in the field of entertainment, featuring pre-recorded audio and audiovisual works and related merchandise for use with Magic Leap hardware, provided via the internet or other computer and electronic communication networks. And then we have the AR Cloud. We'll start with Ori Imbar's opinion. He's been working in the AR field for a decade now, and the company he co-founded, Flyby, went on to be acquired by Apple to become the foundation of AR Kit. He says, AR researchers and industry insiders have long envisioned that at some point in the future, the real-time 3D or spatial map of the world, the AR cloud, will be the single most important software infrastructure in computing, far more valuable than Facebook's social graph or Google's PageRank index. He believes that ARKit and ARCore alone will not usher massive adoption of mobile AR. Magic Leap have already revealed their interest in this area too. Browsing their careers page reveals at least half a dozen roles that include the term cloud, with departments such as cloud design, cloud product and program management, as well as cloud engineering. In the 2016 interview with Wired Magazine, the interviewer wrote the following. Magic Leap, among others, is working on protocols that save a mapped place in the cloud, so it doesn't have to be remapped for each encounter, your unit, or perhaps another unit in the same location, merely needs to register and update any changes in the space. This in turn will let you share virtual objects across different surroundings, even if participants are in distant places. Someone in Barcelona can drop a virtual flower into your virtual vase in Chicago. Because artificial reality is inherently social, its environments will be inherently social and networked. Curiously, all this talk about AR Cloud has also led to rumours of a possible subscription model accompanying the purchase of a Magic Leap device in the future. I'll finish out this section by getting Miesniak's opinion on the AR Cloud. He describes it as a machine-readable, one-to-one scale model of the real world. He says, Our AR devices are the real-time interface to this parallel virtual world, which is perfectly overlaid onto the physical world. To give AR Cloud some context, he offers, If you were asked what is the single most valuable asset in the tech industry today, you'd probably answer that it's Google's search index, or Facebook's social graph, or maybe Amazon's supply chain system. I believe in 15 years' time, there'll be another asset at least as valuable as these. That doesn't exist today. The AR Cloud, and Magic Leap's big opportunity to play a role in it, is a sleeping giant. Magic Leap plans to build a full stack of technology, from operating system to optics. Investors say that this will require developing many components from scratch, as it tries to make the difficult move from research lab prototype to affordable, comfortable consumer product. That quote from Financial Times essentially sums it up. Owning the entire conveyor belt of your product from manufacturer to sale is incredibly difficult and expensive, but if you can pull it off, you stand to benefit from greater control over nearly every aspect of your business. This is something Apple have been very successful at, and Android, with its fragmentation, has struggled with. It permeates the entire experience of a product, from the software to the hardware. By way of example, Miesniak's offers his opinion on why Google's AR platform, Tango, failed to make an impact. Because of this tight dependency on hardware and software, it has been almost impossible for a software developer to build a great system without deep support from the OEM to build appropriate hardware. Google invested a lot to get some OEMs to support the Tango HW spec. Microsoft, Magic Leap, etc. are building their own hardware, and it's ultimately why Apple has been so successful with ARKit, as they have been able to do both. This, I will posit, is why the company have had to raise so much capital and have an equally large valuation, and indeed why investors have been willing to pony up the cash, and it's why a far smaller company like Avegant that we saw earlier have set their ambitions far lower to focus on display tech alone. Hardware is typically a tough business to be in where margins are concerned, but by creating a software-based marketplace where you can take 30% of every product sold made by other companies, well, that's night and day for revenue generation. And then there's value of massive amounts of behavioral data through a cloud system. What people are looking at, how long they're looking at it for, where they happen to be, 
you can start to see that hardware really is the tip of the iceberg regards valuation. Hardware doubtlessly plays an essential role, whether for fashionable reasons, technical capabilities, or any other of the reasons we've explored throughout this episode. But the AR rabbit hole goes very deep. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. <laughs> 